Romans 12, 12 is where we're going to start tonight. And this, this is my verse. So here we go. It's, it's three parts. Very simple. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. And when I first read this group of three statements or commandments, I thought, well, they're kind of random. And the more I thought about it and, and prayed about it and considered it deeply, I, I, I think you can look at them as separately, but I, I'd like to look at them as together tonight under the overall heading of perseverance. That is to say, if you're going to persevere, you need to rejoice in hope. If you're going to persevere, you need to be patient in tribulation. And if you're going to persevere, you need to be constant in prayer. And so uh, perseverance is kind of the idea overall that came to mind here. And so on this first one here, rejoice in hope. I'm just going to take each one in turn. And uh, rejoice in hope, another translation for that word rejoice is celebrate. Celebrate your hope. Uh, I like that. That's important for us. It's, it's good for us to meditate. We're going to go to Isaiah 25 in just a second if you want to go there. It's, it's important for us to meditate, to consider deeply, to take our minds and either go to Scripture or um, recall to mind what God plans to do with this old world in the end. It, it, it's an important part of your walk as a follower of Christ. If you read the words of Christ and you see his deeds, you'll see he was obsessed with the kingdom of God. He just talked about it all the time. And he would say, well, hey, when, we, when people come and recline at the table and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are there, he would talk like that. His, the hope was alive in his heart. And I think that's our example as well. And so I want to look at two texts with you. One is Isaiah 25 and the other is Revelation 22. Just two beautiful prophecies about our hope that, you know, maybe if you are feeling down, if you're feeling persecuted, if you're feeling depressed or beaten down, these are good scriptures to read to help you to rejoice in your hope, to celebrate your hope. When I uh, was a teenager, I used to work at CompUSA. CompUSA no longer exists. Uh, it was, it was taken out by Best Buy. You remember that, CompUSA? We, we had it right down here in Latham Farms. And uh, I remember one day I was, I was sitting around outside of the store as a teenager, and I was talking to my friend uh, from high school, and I was trying to tell him about what eternal life was going to be like. And uh, just, just, I mean, I wasn't laying it on thick. I wasn't really even trying to convert him. I was just, like, talking about it. And... I had a real fuzzy idea of what it was like, real kind of convoluted. And I remember I said to him, well, and I believed in heaven at the time. I said, well, heaven is going to be like, whatever you want, it'll just happen for you right away. And of course, my teenage friend, you know what he wanted? Yes, girls. <laughs> and so for him, heaven is an orgy, right? Of course it would be. I mean, where else would an adolescent mind fantasize about having his needs met, right? So, so that's how I, that's, that's how I um, conceived of it at that time. I'm not blaming anyone else for my <laughs> words here. This is just how I was thinking about it. Um, and then when we started learning about the kingdom of God, well, let me say something, first of all, about the orgy thing. Look, if it's sin, it's not going to be <laughs> the kingdom of God. It's not going to be an eternity if it's sin. So just let's just clearly state that. But when we started learning about the kingdom of God, I discovered, as did many of us here, that this world is where eternal life would be. This actual planet that we know and that God was going to fix this place. He was going to renew it and restore it. And suddenly, huge sections of the Bible started coming alive. 
like Isaiah 25, verse 6, where it says, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. That's saying the same thing twice. Did you catch that? <laughs> the point is simple. It's going to be a good banquet. It's not going to be like one of these where they cater the food and it's all overcooked and the uh, caterers decided to skimp on the meat and they got like grade C meat instead of grade A meat and your vegetables are soggy and uh, tasteless, right? And there's wine, but it's really more like grape juice uh, that's gone bad. This is not that kind of, a, this, is, this is a proper banquet with rich food, uh, well-aged wine, and so on. And then in verse 7, death is swallowed. He will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God, or the Lord Yahweh, will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for Yahweh has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, that he might save us. This is Yahweh. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. I just love those verses. Isaiah 25, 6 through 9. Such encouragement there. I mean, I like to eat. I like to eat, and there's a, there's a big dinner party here. Uh, I don't like to die, and I don't like it when other people die, and death is no more. I also don't like the reproach of, of, of being one of the people of God. We bear a certain reproach, a certain stigma or insult in the society. That's going to be swept away in the kingdom age. And uh, verse 8 also says it's going to wipe away all tears from faces, and then we'll have this Great jubilation as we say, this is our God. This is what we've been waiting for our whole lives. And here it is come to pass. So just great rejoicing in that passage. Really a, a, an encourager if you want to um, look at that, especially when you're looking to rejoice and hope. Let's take a look at Revelation 22, this other section that uh, comes from a different part of the Bible, comes from the end of the Bible. But it uh, very much in the same vein shares about a little bit what it's going to be like in the end after Jesus comes back and establishes God's kingdom, making everything wrong with the world right. And it says in this, this section here, well, Revelation 22 is the last chapter of the Bible. So it's how the Bible ends, right? Uh, it says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal. Can you see it in your mind? The river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on the either side of the river, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. I've never seen a tree like that. <laughs> a tree on either side of the river, that's, it must be a fancy root system or something, I don't know. But then you've got 12 different kinds of fruit. New fruit each month. I have, this, I have this apple tree that I planted two years ago. And I have not gotten an apple from it yet. In fact, I don't even know how it's still alive. It's just, every year it's slightly worse. Like the leaves are kind of uh, wrinkled up. And <laughs> there's like brown on the edges of them. And uh, I can't, in two years, no fruit. This tree every month. <laughs> it's going to be something. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Do our nations need healing? Verse 3, no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign, that's the kingdom idea, forever and ever. Uh, so just a, a beautiful section that talks about how there's going to be healing and how there's not going to be anything accursed and how we're going to have this, you know, incredible. People argue about prophecy like Isaiah and Revelation. 
how much of it is literal, how much of it is symbolic, whatever. Get the overall point. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be, we're going to be healed. We're going to be restored. We're going to be renewed. We're going to be with God. We're going to be with the Lamb. And we're going to be with God's people. And it's going to be good. I can rejoice in that hope. That brings joy into my heart when I think about it. So that's, that's the first one. The second one here I want to spend a little bit more time on is be patient in tribulation. Be patient in tribulation. I don't think that's a very good translation. Uh, there's another Greek word for patient, uh, and this is not that word. This word means more like endure or hold out. You think of uh, a battle where they're holding out and they're not surrendering and they're, and they're, they're continuing to fight. Holding out in tribulation, or maybe the idea of standing your ground. There's a lot of pressure on you to cave, to give in, and you're standing your ground, and, and you're not going to be pushed over. You plant yourself strong. That's, that's what this word is here. And the idea is that in tribulation, you, you knuckle down, you hold on, you hold fast, you endure. You get through it. Just like a storm, you know, if you have to really hold on to something, you know, if there's a big wind or something, I don't know what kind of wind you're, you've been in, but um, this primarily refers to suffering caused by external forces, this word tribulation here. Uh, I, I think I, I'd like to talk about some internal stuff too later on, but let's talk about the external first. That's this idea of persecution. Let's look at Matthew 13. Jesus talked about this, so let's see what Jesus said about it ever so quickly. Um, this idea of tribulation is the same idea as persecution or oppression, all very similar ideas to each other of when people are coming against you specifically for either your faith or how you live because of your faith, these types of things. Uh, it's not about, you know, you're a you're a Yankees fan and somebody else is a Red Sox fan and they're making fun of you. That's not what, that's just, you know, that's, you can't call that persecution. I mean, you can, but it's not anything to do with your faith, okay? So uh, Matthew 13, verse 20, Jesus says, this is the, the parable of the soils or the parable of the sower and the seed. As for that which was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. So this is somebody who, hears the gospel message about the kingdom of God, receives it with joy, is rejoicing, and then, verse 21, has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. So this is the category of person we're talking about here. We don't want to be in that category. We don't want to be in the category of somebody who's like a, a seed that falls among, it's among the rocks, right? Yeah, falls among rocky ground. Think of a gravel road alongside of a farm and some seed goes in the gravel road. Well, yeah, it might spring up and, and reach up to the sun and rejoice, but then that tractor comes along or that person walks by and crushes it, right? <laughs> this, is, this is that category. Those external pressures and persecutions and forces just take that plant down. Um, and once again, verse 21, has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises, on account of the word, immediately he falls away. This is increasingly becoming a problem in our society today, where uh, co-workers, neighbors, or acquaintances are saying, Ew, you're one of those. You're, you're one of those, aren't you? One of those uh, Bible-believing Christians. Hmm. It's increasingly becoming a, an attitude. Certainly not everyone, but in, in, some, in some segments, certainly. Um, and they look at us as, as just wackos. Or they, they say, you know what? You, you're just so judgmental. Of course, that's a judgmental thing to say, right? But you're so judgmental, you Christians. You've got your book, and you're judging everyone else based on your book. Or they say, you're racist, or you're sexist, or you're anti-science, or you don't support the LGBTQI community. 
You know who would make the world better? Is if we got rid of you. Bible thumpers. There's an attitude in our society today that's increasingly moving in that direction because of these different social issues that, that have come along. And, you know, I, I don't know all the, I can't give an explanation for all the reasons. Uh, but what happens when that attitude and those different reasons move from just like someone being annoyed with you to somebody actually persecuting you, where you lose your job because of it? where you lose a relationship because of it, where you uh, suffer financially because of your faith, or where your house or your business gets vandalized because you're so full of hatred. There's such an irony to this, right? Um, so that, and that could happen. I don't know. I don't know the future. I mean, maybe this is just a passing wave and then things will swing back the other way. I, I don't know. Or maybe it'll get worse but I, I want to sort of set for you a little bit of an understanding historically that this is not a new problem for us. This is not a new problem for us. This is a statement by Cornelius Tacitus, who lived um, many centuries ago, describing Nero, the emperor who um, lived at the time of Paul the Apostle and Peter the Apostle in the 60s. Not the 1960s, just the 60s. Um, and so there was a fire in the city of Rome in the year 64. And Nero had to deal with a lot of people accusing him, the emperor, of starting the fire. And uh, so this is, this is, you know, a historical report, not from a Christian source, of this. It says, uh, but neither human help nor imperial munificence nor all the modes of placating heaven could stifle scandal or dispel the belief that the fire had taken place by order. Therefore, to scotch the rumor, Nero substituted as culprits and punished with the utmost refinements of cruelty a class of men loathed for their vices. Guess what? That's us, whom the crowd styled Christians. <laughs> So the emperor says, I'm going to blame this group of people that everybody hates anyhow, the Christians. Christus, the founder of the name, had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius by the sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilatus. You heard of him, right? And the pernicious superstition, that's what they called our religion, was checked for a moment only to break out once more. Not merely in Judea, the home of the disease, another nice... Uh, phrase there, but in the capital itself, the capital's Rome, where all things horrible or shameful in the world collect and find a vogue. Really cynical attitude. First then, he conf the confessed members of the sect were arrested. Next, on their disclosures, vast numbers were convicted, not so much on the count of arson as for hatred of the human race. They thought we hated the human race. We had a PR problem. We still have a PR problem. You know who else had a PR problem? Jesus of Nazareth. It goes with, it goes with the territory. And derision, I mean, not that you should go out of your way to be misunderstood, right? Don't do that. But okay, he goes on. And derision accompanied their end. They were covered with wild beasts. This is really gross. Sorry if this offends your sensibilities. This is what they did to us. They were covered with wild beast skins and torn to death by dogs or they were fastened on crosses, and when daylight failed, were burned to serve as lamps by night. Nero had offered his gardens for the spectacle and gave an exhibition in his circus, mixing with the crowd in the habit of a charioteer or mounted on his car. His, uh, this is an old English translation. So that's, that's around the year 64. So this kind of persecution broke out against us in Rome in the year 64. This is likely the circumstances in which Paul and Peter... Uh, probably died as, as a result of this or around the same time. And uh, we know that they died in Rome in the 60s. Um, and so as a result of this, as Christians, in the, as we got to the end of the first century and into the second century, we became secretive. We started having our meetings early in the morning. We started having them in secret. We didn't want to draw attention to ourselves. So... 
which is understandable, right? I mean, this is like you hear about the underground church in places. So this is, this is what happened. But as a result of that, it spawned all kinds of rumors about us where people were just making up stuff and saying, oh, this is what the Christians are really doing in secret. And it spawned uh, all this, these rumors in the second century. Uh, you want to see a couple of them? Anybody want to see? All right, here we go. Here we go. All right, this is from a novel by Lolianus from the second century. And it, it mentions what they think the Christians are doing. How do you become a Christian? What's the ritual? It's a secret ritual. We know it's evil. We know. But what is the ritual? This is what they say. At this moment, another naked man arrived with a purple belt around his loins. He threw the boy's body on its back, struck it, opened it, removed the heart, and placed it over the fire. <laughs> this is what they think we do to make new members. We sacrifice a boy and we take his heart out and cook it. Then he took the roasted heart off the fire and cut it into halves. He sprinkled it with barley and drenched it with oil. When it was sufficiently prepared, he distributed portions of it to the initiates. And when they were holding them in their hands, he made them swear an oath by the blood of the heart not to leave in the lurch nor to betray, even if they would be arrested or if they would be tortured or if their eyes would be dug out. Uh, so this is what people were saying about us in the second century, um, that we were killing boys and eating their hearts. What do we call this today? Fake news! <laughs> this is the ancient equivalent of fake news, right? And uh, th this is just a fictional book, but, you know, they make, they make the Christians, make us look like this. Or how about this other account from... Uh, who was this from? Marcus Cornelius Fronto, uh, also lived in the second century. And this is what, this is what he had heard about us. And it's funny because he's honest in certain places where he's like, well, at least that's what I heard. That's what I heard about those Christians, right? And he says, everywhere also there is mingled among them, Christians, a certain religion of lust. So we're sex fiends. And they call one another promiscuously brothers and sisters. I hear that they adore the head of an ass, donkey, the basest of creatures. Some say that they would worship the genitals of their pontiff and priest. I know not whether these things are false. <laughs> this, is, this is what they, the society, the non-believing pagan Roman society thought about Christians in the second century. Now, the story about the initiation of young novices is as much to be detested as it is well known. This he's sure about. An infant covered over with flour or meal that it may deceive the unwary is placed before him who is to be stained with their rites. This infant is slain by the young pupil who has been urged on as if to harmless blows on the surface of the meal with dark and secret wounds. Thirstily, oh horror, they lick up its blood. Eagerly they divide its limbs. By this victim they are pledged together and of their banqueting it is well known of all men speak of it everywhere. All right, so that's how to be a new Christian, you eat a baby, uh, which is, believe it or not, kind of a stock criticism in the ancient world. <laughs> like uh, eating babies and having wild sex with relatives, those are kind of like your standard go-tos for like how you want to accuse secret religious groups. And there were other secret religious groups other than Christians, uh, but this is specific to us. On a solemn day, so this is, this is how they interpret our love feast. or What we, we used to do before COVID, we, we would have meals together, right? And we'd eat, uh, I don't know, once every other month or something. We'd get together. and So this is how they would interpret that. On a solemn day, they assemble at the feast with all their children, sisters, mothers, people of every sex and of every age. Doesn't sound bad so far. Uh, it sounds just like a potluck. Uh, there, after much feasting, yeah, we do that, when the fellowship has grown warm and the fervor of incestuous lust has grown hot with drunkenness, a dog that is better, a dog that has been tied to the chandelier is provoked. So you got to imagine this is a secret meeting happening in a, in a, in a room that has a candlestick or a chandelier uh, uh, on the ground, and there's a dog attached to a leash that's attached to that candlestick. And um, 
So they throw a small piece of offal or meat beyond the length of the leash, the line by which the dog is bound, to rush and spring. And thus the conscious light being overturned and extinguished in the shameless darkness, the connections of an abominable lust involve them in the uncertainty of faith. Although, of fate, although not all in fact, yet in consciousness, all alike incestuous, since by the desire of all of them, everything is sought. So in other words, uh, after we're done eating, uh, we throw a piece of meat to the dog. The dog tips over the light in the room. It goes dark, and then we just have a big orgy with uh, indiscriminate uh, choosing of partners, including family members. Whew. So they call this cannibals. They call this incestuous, and I, I don't, I don't want to like overwhelm you with this, but they also call this atheists because we didn't worship the statues. Everyone knew the statues were gods. Christians said, no, don't worship the statues, so they called us atheists, all right? So they called us cannibals, incestuous, and atheists, and I, sh I showed you a couple of the other things they said, too. This is what they, they called us. They hated us. They persecuted us. They excluded us from workplaces. They tortured us and killed us. They sicked wild animals on us. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but they, they tortured and killed us for centuries. But you know what? We're still here. Oh, where is that Roman Empire? Who's the Roman Emperor today? I, for, I forget. Who's the Roman Emperor? Oh, we haven't had one for 1,600 years. And yet we are 2.4 billion strong as Christians. We've made it through this. You know, they, 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 we think it's persecution if, if somebody in our workplace criticizes us because of our beliefs. Well, at least they're not saying you're eating babies. That's worse. And we've been through that, right? At least they're not grabbing one of your legs and, and tying it to a, a branch that's been bent way down and the other leg to the trunk of a tree and then cutting it so that it tears us in two pieces because we've been through that too. And we've been through getting burned at the stake, right? We're still here. So we can endure. We know we can endure in tribulation. And what we're going through right now, it's very mild. It's very mild, historically speaking, compared to this. Now, I want to switch gears for a second. There are external issues, and then there are internal issues. An external issue, uh, when it comes to tribulation and persecution, is somebody that's you know, persecuting you, coming at you, excluding you. Then there, there, there's a sense of an internal suffering that I think a lot of us deal with that uh, can take us out from persevering. And that is this whole idea, this whole problem we have with sin. I don't know about you, but uh, see if you can relate to this. Uh, you get drunk one night, or you watch porn, or you, you watch some movie that basically just is porn, but, you know, it's soft porn. Or maybe you uh, cheat at work or you get in a fight with somebody in your house and you say some really mean things. Or, or maybe you get stoned or you gossip on the phone about, some, you know, whatever your issue is. I don't know what it is. I'm just throwing out some things, right? And then the next morning comes and you get up and whether you're hungover or you're, or you're waking up on the couch because you got in a fight with your spouse or you wake up in the gutter, whatever it is, you wake up and you know what you're supposed to do. You're a Christian, you love God, you follow Christ, you know what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to read that book. You're supposed to read the Bible. You're supposed to pray. And you say to yourself, I can't do it. I'm the most worthless scum of the earth. I'm a hypocrite. I'm... I can't, I can't read this book. I can't have it even touch me. I'm, I'm stained. I'm a maggot. I'm dirty. I'm unworthy. Have you ever experienced anything like that in your life? And you know what we say? We say to ourselves, I need to suffer. I need to be punished. I have a good punishment for you. Are you ready for this? It's not whipping yourself. Okay? It's not, uh, you know, whatever. It's you take the Bible, you go to Psalm 51, and you read that out loud. I'll, I'll write it down here so you can catch that. You, go to, you, you take the Bible, and you go to Psalm 51. 
It's a psalm of repentance. And you read that out loud. That's your punishment. That's how you can suffer. That's how you can make it right. And don't skimp out on the part where it says, create in me a new heart. Right? And cleanse me. And renew a right spirit within me. Right? That whole part of repentance. And, and you go through that psalm and, and you say those words to God. That's your punishment. You do it as many days as it takes. Because here's the bottom line. If you let go of God in your morning, chances are you've let go of him for the whole day. And for a lot of us, it makes it all that much easier to let go the next day and the next day. And now what might have been just a, a blip on the radar, a little mistake in our life, snowballs into this whole series of events because we continued in our sin, because we didn't think we were good enough to be with God anymore, right? And now we're way over there. You've got to hold on to God. You've got to endure in tribulation, whether it's persecution from outside or whether it's your own crazy thoughts saying, I, I'm not, I can't do this. You know what I mean? You can't give up. You can't give up. It says, be patient in tribulation or endure in tribulation. And then, last of all, be constant in prayer. Another translation for this word constant is busily engaged or uh, the little Scott and Jones d dictionary said, obstinately persist in prayer. I tell you, when you've sinned and you know it and there's no, no hiding it, you got to be just kind of like a stubborn knucklehead sometimes. Be like, well, I know I don't belong here and, and, and I don't want to go to church or I don't want to go to fellowship or I don't want to pray with my prayer partner. But you know what? I'm going to be obstinately persistent in prayer because that's when you need it. <laughs> right? That's the time you need it when you feel like garbage, when your head is all messed up, when you, when you don't feel worthy. That's when you need God the most. When life is good and you just got a job and, you know, it's, the birds are chirping and the sky. You, that, I mean, God's good then too, but you don't really need him then. When you need God is when you're in trouble. So we need to be constant in prayer. And we see this over and over. Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. You see that there? It's not just bad things. I mean, I was mentioning like when we struggle with sin and guilt and shame, right? But in, in good things too, in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So this, we're, we're supposed to be a praying people, right? We're supposed to pray. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 says, Rejoice always. Kind of sounds like Romans 12, 12. Uh, rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Again, this is not just the happy times. In the happy times, praise God. You eat a Philly cheesesteak and it's running down your chin and you're just like, oh, this is the best thing ever. Praise God for that sandwich, right? But also go to God and ask him for help in the times when you just had a fight with your parents or your kids or some other situation, a co-worker, right? All circumstances, for this is the will of God and Christ Jesus for you. And then Colossians 4, 2, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. If we, if we don't pray, pray, pray in the good times and the bad times, we're not going to persevere. So these, once again, are the three points from Romans 12, 12. Number one, rejoice in hope. you got to get that hope in your heart. You can't get it in there without reading it in the Bible. Reading those prophecies, Isaiah 25, Revelation 22, familiarizing yourself. Get it crystal clear in your mind. What is God planning for this old world? How is he going to heal it? What parts of it do you look forward to? Rejoicing in that hope. And then enduring or being patient in tribulation, whether that tribulation is from without or from within. And then last of all, be constant in prayer. And if you do these things, you're going to persevere. God will be there. He'll hold your hand. He'll get you through it. Because this right here is your lifeline to God. And he'll, he'll get you through it. You will persevere if you do these things.